Mark chapter 3 uh, is our destination this morning. Mark chapter 3, we're going to skip ahead a little bit from where we were last week, and we're going to read Mark chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 20 and going on to verse 35 of Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. He then called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his goods. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that you are a speaking God. We're thankful that you are a speaking God. We're thankful that you have spoken to us. We're thankful that you have spoken fully and finally in your Son, the Lord Jesus, that the Lord Jesus is your final word to us, and he is a word of love and compassion and justice and righteousness and pity. Father God, we're so thankful that we can look directly at the Lord Jesus and see you. Lord, what an astonishing statement that is. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Lord, help us to look to see you then until our eyes wear out. Help us to see you, Lord Jesus, to see your compelling glory. Help us to see you, Lord Jesus, to see your humbling Love, help us to see you, Lord Jesus, and see your sin killing sacrifice on the cross for us. Lord, you have spoken. But so often in our lives, the white noise of our busyness blocks out your voice. So help us in this time to hear. We're so thankful for the Lord today. We're so thankful for church where we get to to come apart, to come away from everything else that distracts us, from everything else that blocks out your voice and hear and focus. Lord, we live in a distracted age and we are a distracted people, distracted by good things, necessary things, important things, but also distracted by things that don't really matter at all. In this time, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would focus us in on the Word of God. Because, Father, you have spoken, and we must listen. Father, I pray that you would be with me, that you would be with me as I speak, that these would be your words, your thoughts, and not mine. Father, we pray this seed would land on good soil in our hearts and bear fruit for your kingdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bridge Church exists to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore in Champaign and beyond. And and I love every couplet in that phrase. We exist to make the real Jesus 
impossible to ignore in Champagne and beyond, right? The real Jesus, not the Jesus of our imagination, not the Jesus of our dreams, but the real Jesus we meet in Scripture. Just this Jesus is our focus. Bridge Church exists to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore in Champagne and beyond. We want to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore because it's very easy to live in Champagne Urbana. I don't know what I'm doing with this. It's really easy to live in Champagne Urbana and ignore the Lord Jesus. It's very easy to live in Champagne and ignore the real Jesus, and we want to change that. That's why we exist. We exist to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore in Champagne and beyond because we recognize that it's not that Illinois is like the kingdom of God and Champaign-Urbana is this, this little corner that needs reaching for Jesus. No, no, no. Our desire is for more and more people in, in Illinois, more and more people around the world to know and love Jesus because we know we're not here to make Jesus king of Champagne. We're here to proclaim that Jesus is king of Champagne. And that changes everything. Husbands, your, relation, your responsibility in the home is not to make Jesus king of the home. Husbands, your responsibility in the home is to proclaim that Jesus is king in your home. Because if you don't, when the Lord Jesus comes to assess the state of your marriage, husbands, when he knocks on the door, he's looking for you. Adam, where are you? He called out. After the fall, husbands, we need to take that responsibility seriously. I'm a C-plus husband on my good days. But God's word shows us a better way. We exist to make the real Jesus. That was free, by the way. That's, I mean, that, you know, you don't have to pay for that bit. We exist to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore in Champagne and beyond. And we want to think about how we make Jesus impossible to ignore this morning. That's what the first few verses of this passage are about. Now, how do we make the real Jesus impossible to ignore? Well, first of all, we recognize who is the real Jesus. Who is the real Jesus? There's no responsible school of thought that really denies that Jesus of Nazareth existed, right? We've got more evidence for the existence of Jesus of Nazareth than we have for any other ancient person. And it's not even close. So the question is not, did Jesus exist? Everybody agrees that he did. The question is, who is he? Who is he? And if we read the Gospels like adults, we have to recognize there are only really three different options. Either Jesus was Lord, or Jesus was a liar, or Jesus was a lunatic. Now, those aren't my titles, but they fit perfectly over this scripture this morning. Jesus is Lord, or Jesus is a liar. He knew he wasn't God, and he pretended to be. Or Jesus was a lunatic. He thought he was God, and he wasn't. There's no third option. And really, those three options become two options, don't, we, don't they, as we'll see in this passage this morning. You either worship Jesus or you deny him. There's no third way where we try to be sort of vaguely interested, vaguely friendly with Jesus, but we don't really give ourselves to him. We don't really worship him. You either worship him or you deny him. It's, it's that simple. <clears throat> We've skipped ahead a little bit um, since the last time we were together last week. And, and really from, uh, from chapter 2, verse 23, where we left off last week, to chapter 3, verse 20, where we picked up this week, two things, broadly speaking, two things have happened. Jesus has grown in popularity, and Jesus has grown in opposition. The crowds following Jesus have expanded, have exploded. We're going to see that here in verse 20 of Mark chapter 3. But the opposition has got more ferocious, more determined, more vocal. Because again, there's only two ways to live, right? Either we love Jesus and we worship Jesus, we're part of the crowd that follows him and would lay down our lives for him, or we're opposed to Jesus and we're trying to destroy him, we're trying to kill him, we're trying to 
get rid of him. Verse 20 and 21 tell us, don't ignore Jesus. Don't ignore Jesus. If we're going to make the real Jesus impossible to ignore out there, then the real Jesus has got to be impossible to ignore in here. And the real Jesus has got to be impossible to ignore in here. Because sometimes when we pray for revival, we're praying for a bunch of people from the outside to come in. Revival is when a bunch of people from the outside, from the inside go out. When we are so captured, so overwhelmed by the glory of God, we spill out of our church buildings once a week and we can't help telling people who we love. We can't help telling people about the Lord Jesus. So revival starts right here as the people of God get hold of the Word of God, as you and me stop ignoring Jesus. Verse 20, then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. Jesus went home, we're told in verse 20. Uh, the more literal translation of this is that Jesus went to the house. People think this was probably Simon Peter's house in Capernaum. That was the, the base of his ministry, the base of his operations. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. The real Jesus was becoming impossible to ignore in Capernaum. Jesus was there and the crowds flocked. They left their work. They left their entertainments. They left everything else that they were doing and they went to where Jesus was. Because when you really meet Jesus, you desire to be where he is. The crowd gathered again, Mark tells us, so they could not even eat. I've never been this busy. This is, this is crowds and this is pressure and this is a crush that few of us have probably ever seen. Jesus went home and the crowd gathered again so they could not even eat. And when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him for they were saying, he is out of his mind. We have almost no information in the Gospels about Jesus' adult family. Almost none. We know that eventually, we assume that eventually they all came to know the Lord Jesus. We know that eventually uh, James and Jude, his half-brothers at least did, uh, because they both wrote letters in the New Testament and because James uh, was a key leader in the New Testament church. And because Paul tells us that the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, specifically appeared to James, his half-brother. But that hasn't happened yet. When his family heard it, they went out to seize him. When his family heard that, that all these people <clears throat> were coming to hear Jesus, that all these people were coming to worship Jesus, they went out to seize him. They traveled from Nazareth, where they presumably were, down to Capernaum to come and seize him. Almost every time Mark uses this word seize, he's talking about the arrest of Jesus at the end of the Gospels or the arrest of John the Baptist at the beginning of the Gospels. Seize is a word that means to be taken away without your consent. So they were coming to get Jesus, to remove him from the situation, to get him away from the crowds. Maybe they were worried about him. Maybe they're worried for his safety. Maybe they're worried, you know, his mum was worried he wasn't eating. Maybe that's what's going on. Well, no, Mark tells us something different, doesn't he? When his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. He's out of his mind. They looked at Jesus, and they didn't think, there's the Lord. They looked at Jesus, and they thought, there's a lunatic. There's a lunatic. They made Jesus a liar. Now, why do I say that? Why did they think Jesus was out of their mind? Jesus was out of his mind. Because they were ignoring the Word of God. And if you ignore the Word of God, 
you are treating Jesus like he is out of his mind. If your Bible sits on the shelf day by day, week by week, month by month, what you're telling Jesus is, thanks for everything, but actually, I think you're out of your mind. When you ignore the Word of God, this is what you tell Jesus. Think about the upbringing that Jesus' half-brothers and sisters would have had. Mary and Joseph must have told them who Jesus was. Mary and Joseph must have told them things like what's recorded in Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Joseph is betrothed to Mary, which is a, a, sort of a very formal engagement, closer to actually being married than what our current state of engagement is today. And Joseph hears that she is with child. And Joseph is smarter than a lot of skeptics give him credit for, Right? Sometimes around Christmas, you'll hear people say, well, of course Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. They just didn't know where children came from back then, right? Like they were dumb. No, no, no. Joseph knows where children came, come from. This is why we have children's church. Jesus knows where children come from. So he knows that if Mary is with child, something has happened, and he has to, and he has every right to divorce her. The scriptures tell us that Joseph was a, a righteous man, a just man, so he resolves to divorce Mary quietly. And then the angel comes and tells him how exactly Mary has conceived. Joseph must have told Jesus' half-brothers that story. Mary must have told them the story recorded for us in Luke chapter 1, verses 27 through 38. What does the angel tell Mary? He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. Now, it's easy for me to say that as a big brother, right? Because I assume that, <clears throat> that every younger sibling thinks of their big brother like that. But listen, if, if you're a younger brother... Oh, sister, you understand this would have been a challenge for Jesus' half-brothers. But think of the privileges and the opportunities they had to see the Lord grow up sinless, to hear those accounts from Mary and Joseph. But they ignored Jesus. And we treat Jesus like a liar when we ignore his word. We treat Jesus like a liar when we ignore his word. Let, let's put for a moment aside the privileges that Jesus' family would have had watching Jesus grow up and hearing the promises of God. Let, let's park that over here for a minute. Because some of you are thinking, well, that's a nice story, Pastor, but, but there's a whole lot of conjecture in there. And, and, and maybe that's true. So let's not think about their privileges and their opportunities for a second. Let's think about your privileges and our privileges and our opportunities. You have the scripture in your house, on your phone, in your pocket, in your heart language, and you don't read it? What is going on? What is going on when God's people ignore God's word? No wonder our churches are so weak. No wonder our worship is so half-hearted. No wonder Christians have such little influence on society. Stop watching the news and wondering what in the heck's going on out there and start looking at your closed Bible and think, what in the heck's going on in here? We don't want to hear God's word. Imagine explaining that to someone in the two-thirds world, someone who would long to have the Bible in their heart language completely accessible. What in the world do we think is more important than regular, faithful time in God's Word? And if we think things are more important than that, what is that showing us about our heart? And I know we're busy. And I know our time is, is, is stressed. And I know we have a dozen responsibilities from the moment we get out of bed to the moment we get, get back into bed. And I know that the easiest thing to cut out is the Scriptures because that feels like we're not doing anything, doesn't it? That feels like a waste of time. That, that feels self-indulgent. We're, we're, we're busy people. I, I'm busy, preacher. I don't have time to sit down and read the Bible every day. Do you have time to sit down and watch TV every day? Well, what would happen if you switched your TV time and your Bible time? What would happen if you switched your, your phone time with your Bible time? 
Don't you think the glory of God would start meaning more to you? Don't you think the spiritual life would, would start uh, being more important to you? Don't you think that your spiritual power would increase and grow and that sin would be less important to you and that Jesus would be more compelling and glorious to you? You call him a liar when you ignore his word. You treat Jesus like a liar when you ignore the scriptures. I'm a C plus husband, I told you that. But I, I don't want to say stay as a C plus husband. I, I want to get to at least B minus, right? That, that's the least Rachel deserves, right? Now, so, so I read the Bible not because it, it's filled with helpful hints, but because it shapes my heart. Listen, my Bible reading is hindered by two things in general, and maybe it's the same for you. My Bible reading is hindered by thing number one. My soul shrivels to the concerns of the day. And all I care about is getting through the day. All I care about is solving the problem in front of me. And that hinders my Bible reading. My Bible reading is hindered by number two, the fact that I'm, I'm very happy just to... Just to putt around in the foothills and not climb the mountains of God's glory. But when you open the Bible, you, you, you dismiss the, the vapor and the vanity and the unreality and the unimportance of, of 90% of life and you dig down into something deep and real and satisfying. Or if you like the other analogy, you, you climb up to these beautiful mountains where you see extraordinary views of God's glory. So don't stop reading the Bible because you're not getting anything out of it. I don't really understand that phrase. I went to meet with the living God in his word. I didn't get anything out of it. What are you telling people about your heart when you say that? You think the Bible's boring? Where do you think the problem is if you think the Bible is boring? What do you think the answer is if you think the Scripture is boring? Do you think the answer is to, to close the Bible and say, well, I gave it a go? Or do you think the answer is to get on the floor, on your face, and plead with God to open your eyes so that you would value what's really valuable? If you think the scriptures are boring, you've got no right to call anything else interesting. Because God speaks to us in his word. God speaks to us in his word. Listen to Psalm 29, verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord makes the deer gives birth, strips the forest bare, and all in his temple cry glory. What can possibly be more important than getting our hearts fixed on the scriptures? And when we do this, our church will grow. So let, let's think for a second about let's think for a second about what it means for our church to grow. Because several times in the last couple of weeks, people have texted me or, or I've been talking to people, and they've said, you know, I just I just want more people to come to church. And that's great, man. Me too. Right? I want more people to come to church because Jesus is worthy of more people coming to church. But, but here's the thing. Where we are in, in the life cycle of our church, our health is just as important, if not more, than our growth. We've got to have a healthy foundation down in our hearts, built on and based on the Word of God. Because if we don't, then we don't have anything to offer anybody else. If we don't, 
We don't have anything to offer a sinful, lost and dying world. If our hearts aren't healthy, then we've got nothing to offer anybody. Tozer put it this way once. He said, if revival is more of the same, then the last thing we need right now is revival, right? But if revival is, some, is, is God's people getting on their face so the Word of God gets in their heart, then that's exactly what we need. So, that, so don't, pray, don't pray that our church would grow and then ignore the Bible. Pray that our church would grow and then go invite someone to church because the God you've met in the Bible compels you out of your front door into the streets. This is why... Once or twice a week, I go out to, to these neighborhoods over here and just hang those door hangers on doors, right? 50, 25 at a time. And th there are some barking dogs in the neighborhoods around our church, by the way. I just want you to know that. Listen, <laughs> listen. Uh, I know some of you think that's a stupid waste of time. Because some of you have told me you think that's a stupid waste of time. Okay, but get this, right? Sure, of course. That's not the most strategic use of time and resources in 2022. I mean, I get that. Much better for all of us to knock on our neighbor's door and invite them to church. But, but I don't see a lot of that happening. Why? Because our hearts haven't been conquered by the God we've met in the Word. Because we're ignoring the Word of God. So we're ignoring the God of the Word. We find faithful, regular giving a struggle because we haven't met God in His Word. Our hearts aren't conquered by the God of the Word because we're ignoring the Word of God. It, it's closed. So Jesus tells us we can trust Him with our money. We can trust Him with our income. He even says it on the notes, in God we trust. It's very kind of God to organize the, our money like that so that every time we spend, we're, we're reminded, I can trust God, I can trust God, I can trust God. It doesn't say it on my checkbook, so I have to remember it every month. But listen, if, if we want our church to be, to go where we want it to go, then we've got to get our hearts in the Scriptures. We've got to meet with the God of the Word in the Word of God. Because otherwise, of course we're going to keep our money to ourselves. Of course we're not going to faithfully, regularly give. Think of it. When, they heard, when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. Do you have a friend who thinks you're taking this Jesus thing a bit too seriously? You're in great company, my friends. You have a friend who thinks you're wasting your life, living your life for Jesus. You are in great company. Because these aren't some randoms off the street that heard Jesus preach once and they're like, nah, not for me. No, no, no. This was Jesus' family. These were the closest people to him. And what do they think? He was out of his mind. So be encouraged if people think you're a little bit crazy for worshipping Jesus. Uh, and if people don't think you're a little bit crazy for worshipping Jesus, maybe be a little bit worried. That's what we saw last week, wasn't it? Je Jesus doesn't fit into our lives. He's not supposed to. Fitting Jesus into our life is like pouring that fresh wine into old wineskins. It's going to burst. Fitting Jesus into our life is like sewing that new piece of cloth onto an old garment. It's going to tear it apart. Friends, listen. When you meet the God of the Word, in the Word of God. You will be so happy for God to come and take your life and reorder it and tear it apart. And people around you won't understand. Maybe the people closest to you won't understand. But you will be in such good company. Don't you want to be in this company? Paul says in Philippians, um, I long to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship in his sufferings. Paul's a very strange man, but we understand the first bit, right? We want that power of resurrection. Yes, that's what I want in my heart. Resurrection power to stand on the throat of the sin that drags me away from Jesus. That's what I want. That's what I'm praying for in my life. But then Paul says, I want the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings. We're like, well, 
Friends, what a privilege to suffer like Jesus. What a privilege to be rejected by the people close to us for the sake of Jesus, because he was too. What a privilege if our friends, our families, our colleagues, our neighbours think we're a little bit weird. We are a little bit weird. You know you, the strange stuff we believe because we believe this book? A man was dead and came back to life. So gloriously weird. Lean into that. Yeah, you believe some weird stuff. You, you don't quite fit in because your heart isn't shaped by the culture. Your heart is shaped by the Bible because your heart hasn't been conquered by the God of the world. Your heart has been conquered by the God of the Word. Praise God people look at you and they're confused. You, you did what with your money? You do what with your time? <laughs> I text Jesse at five o'clock in the morning because I know that's the, uh, that's the only time I can get him before he goes to work, right? God bless Jesse, getting up even earlier than that to spend time in the scriptures. And even I'm like, really, Jesse? You can do it in the afternoon? Praise God for that. Make time in your day to be with God. Because we spend so much time in our lives worrying about things that just don't matter while we neglect the thing that matters the most. They went out to seize him. His family heard it and went out to seize him. His family. But eventually, like we said, we know Jesus' half-brothers, Jesus' half-sisters, God saved. We know they came to worship Jesus. We know they rose. the brothers rose to prominent positions of leadership in the church. So if there is someone you are praying for, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Pray and pray and pray and pray. Bang on the door of heaven for your loved one who is ignoring Jesus, who you raised to love the Lord, who you raised in church, who you are running hard with. And then they went one way and you stuck on with Jesus. Keep praying for that individual who's ignoring the Lord Jesus because guess what? So were these men and then Jesus came and flipped their lives upside down. They met the risen Lord and your friend, your family member, your neighbour, your colleague can too. So don't lose hope. Pray and pray and pray for your wayward family, for your wayward friends. One of my closest friends in college, we served together in that college ministry and a couple of years afterwards and, and at some point in those years his heart went cold to the Lord Jesus and, and now he, he's no longer following the Lord. So I pray for him because he's beyond my help but no one's beyond the help of the Lord. If we don't fix our eyes on the Word of God, we will never have our hearts fixed on the God of the Word. If our eyes aren't filled with Scripture, our hearts will never be filled with Jesus. It really is that simple. Because Jesus is the God who gives himself to us. Friend, Jesus has given himself to you. He gave his body for you. He gave his blood for you. He gave his beard to be plucked and his back to be broken. He gave his bones to be out of joint. He gave his lungs to be agonizingly emptied with air as he died on the cross for us, shedding his blood and breaking his body. We're a forgetful people. And Jesus knows that, so the Lord gives us graciously reminders the lord reminds us in scripture and we must visit scripture every day but the lord reminds us in this meal here in front of me as we take the small cups of grape juice we remember jesus blood was shed for me as we eat the the small crackers in the cup we remember jesus body was broken for me and as we remember we resolve we resolve to get our eyes in the Scriptures so that our hearts might be in the Scriptures. We resolve no longer to live ignoring the Lord Jesus, not treating him like a liar or a lunatic, but treating him as our Lord. We're going to 
close our service here in a few minutes, eating and drinking the Lord's Supper together. But before we do that, let's pray together and ask the Lord to apply these things into our hearts. Father God, we're thankful that you are a speaking God, and I pray that you would have spoken to us today. Lord, that we would not ignore you by ignoring your word. That we would not dismiss you by denying your word, but we would follow you by obeying your word. Father, please shape us at Bridge Church into a group of people that take your word more seriously than anything else and desire to be shaped by your word more than anything else and desire to follow your word more closely than anything else. Lord, have mercy on us and help us to do that. We ask in Jesus' name.